Jerry's going to set up uh, a couple experiments here. And uh, I told Jerry I would vamp while he's uh, doing that. So let me say a few things about demonstrations of the type we're going to see. I think they are a great opportunity to teach science through the lens of 19th century technology. And I also believe that it's very important to uh, all of us that demonstrations reinstill the wonder of the technology when it was new. You know, today we take for granted sound recording and we take for granted sound playback. But in 1878, this technology was magic. And I use that term as Arthur C. Clarke used it when he said, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Now this simple machine that we're going to see, the phonograph, magically repeated anything it heard. And when you read the press accounts from the 1878, it's a monumental thing that you're reading about. It's very clear that Edison's phonograph had a mind-bending impact on humanity. And I think that the phonograph bent minds because the phonograph bent time. It could stretch time. It could shorten time, it could stop time, it could even reverse time. You know, sounds that were pitched higher, sounds that were pitched lower, talking backwards, sounds that were disembodied from their creator. I mean, this magic had never, ever been done. So when you recorded a sound, you froze it in time. And when you messed with its playback, you didn't just manipulate the sound, you tinkered with time itself. When you put the recording away to be played at a later date, you sent your voice into the future to be resuscitated, resurrected after your very death. So as you think about these, what we're going to see, both the phonograph and the phonograph, I ask you to forget what you know about sound. Put yourself in the position of somebody who had never seen sound frozen on the paper, who had never seen sound reproduced. It's about what we know and what we're used to when we meet that technology for the first time. Let's hear it as they did. So, should I, Jerry, should I just start with the phonograph? We have Bob Farrell with us, world famous trombonist. Where are you, Bob? There you are. Sound has never, ever been seen. I mean, people have seen waves wash up on the Jersey Shore, excuse me, the French Riviera. <laughs> <laughs> They've seen waves, they kind of have an idea, maybe, but the idea of sound as waves, or the idea that sound can be written down, that's kind of a mind-blowing idea. So it's a very technologically advanced idea. Now, this is not easy to operate. Yes, we, it is the world's first and most useless recording device. Um, but the use, of course, is to inscribe a sound. So Bob is going to blow, blow the higher level, whichever you would like first, the F that we were talking about. We're going to are you going to be safe then? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, just fire in a hole. <laughs> okay, give me a sure. give me, give me, uh, It want to be as close as possible, right? Yes. Mike, can you see him? I knew it. You're far away, but I'm not sure I still want to be that long. Okay. Tell me what you do. practicing. <laughs> the instrument maker is Anton Stuben. He lives in the Netherlands, outside of Amsterdam. He usually does only this type of work for museums, but he built this phonograph to uh, the patent specifications. Anton, I asked Anton to make it because 
He has a wonderful feel for mid-19th century technology. And since we've had to create a, a lot of this out of, just from rough drawings, Anton made all the right choices in, uh, in, in uh, materials and finishes and so forth. There's one thing about this that I love, and it shows Anton's great sense of humor. You notice that the button that I push here to release the recording stratum is red. Now, they would never have, they would never have used a, a red button in the mid-19th century. And I asked Anton about that. I said, you know, isn't that historically incorrect? He said, yes, but all record buttons are red. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's try the lower, the, the higher lower. Okay. Okay, and this is this one uh, Bob. We need to find those pictures. This one Bob has to be super. Okay, watch your ears. see this, I'll leave it on the photograph. It's difficult to see. There are two backlit recordings over in the corner. There. So if you'd like to take a picture, those would be the ones to take the picture to. Bob, I'm going to turn you over to Jerry and to Tony Wellman. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bob. It was an honor. Bob. Yeah, yeah. Hey, by the way, Bob, you know, there are not a lot of phonographs Phonogram, phonogram made in the 21st century. I think, I think Bob is the first musician to make one in the 21st century. So thank you, Bob. Where's Tony? Can I go first? Yeah, yeah. Okay, our, our next demonstration is the, the tinfoil phonograph. Uh, this is a replica machine. Uh, the original was built in 1878 by a machinist at Edison Art and Music in Bergman. Um, we're using uh, actual tin foil. Tin foil has a little bit different feel than what you might expect. If you, you know, we uh, every day very commonly handle aluminum foil. Aluminum foil is, is prickly, it tears easily. Tin foil has a different feel to it. It's, it's smoother. It bends. It, you can actually bend and push it much easier. Um, I've been doing uh, recording demonstrations on phonographs uh, over the past several years at, at colleges and universities, uh, often for audio students. And the audio professors, I found, really appreciate it because of how physical a medium it is. Unlike digital recording today, it's, it's, it can be difficult for a, a student of audio to wrap their mind around the, the basic physics of what's going on when you record sound. But with the phonograph, it makes it very, very apparent. And that's equally, equally as true with the phonograph. So we'll start with the recording of speech. Um, Tony, who's a professional voice announcer, is going to ad lib. Sure. And then we'll have Bob record some trumpet, and then we'll play it back. Um, so yeah, if you guys keep this open, then I can... Give me a, a few turns to get up to speed. Yeah, just try to... Jerry, just gently do this first, just make sure the group is good. Wait till I get it up to speed. Throw me a cue. Okay. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. 
Vive la France! <laughs> Tony, uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes. You want to speak? Speak or play? Play. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you want a, do you want a chair? Or do you... Oh, no, no, I can stand up. This is an excerpt of a piece uh, entitled The Blue Bells of Scotland. It was popular in the late 1800s for brass players to take a real simple little theme and break it into three variations, each one getting more and more difficult. And of course, they would throw in a cadenza so they could show up their, their fabulous technique. Uh, this is like in the, um, the, the, uh, the style of Arthur Pryor, Bohemian Krill, um, a lot of great early musicians. No pressure. Okay. <laughs> Signal, yeah. Tony. You got you got some good lungs, but you can't read it. <laughs> well, right. yeah, I can. Mary had a little lamb. It's like braille. <laughs> I can feel it. Okay, here we go. Thank you. Yeah. 